so much everybody for joining. Um, just to say, to, to kick us off with, this is um, uh, part, part of our, our Knowledge Exchange series, which is co-organized by UNHCR, the Connected Learning in Crisis Consortium, and by the Open University. So I'm here with on behalf of CLCC and UNHCR, and Cool is here uh, as the co-organizer on behalf of the OU. Um, we're delighted today to have with us um, Jamie Alexandre and uh, Martin Weller. Um, so Martin is a professor at the Open University um, who has, he, he's got, always had a special interest in the application of new technology for academic practice. He leads the Open Educational Resources uh, Hub research team at the OU. And at the moment, he's running a portfolio of projects examining the impact of OERs um, and current area of research is in open education and digital scholarship. Uh, Jamie, meanwhile, is uh, the co-founder of Learning Equality, who have worked very closely with um, UNHCR for several years. Um, and as well as uh, uh, learning equality. He's also the co-founder of several educational technology platforms, include, including this course, ESL Genie and KA Lite. Um, and alongside UNHCR um, on the Instant Network Schools project, we've collaborated with learning equality um, on the Calibri platform, which is which has used open educational resources and organized educational resources as a way of, of bringing um, uh, learning resources to refugees in low resource contexts. Um, so today we're convening this discussion to talk about open educational resources. We felt it would be an opportune moment to do this because um, next week is the UN Secretary General's Transforming Education Summit and open education resources are high up on the agenda of um, things to be discussed at that summit. Um, open educational resources for a long time have been dis spoken about as um, as a way of of, bring, of of or an opportunity, I should say, to improve the quality of education as well as to improve policy dialogue, knowledge sharing, and capacity building. Um, so Martin's talk will look at how OERs and open educational practices can be utilised in different contexts to improve access, social justice and as well as responding to the online pivot. And Jamie will talk a little bit about OERs and in particular focus on um, how they can be utilized in low resource contexts and in refugee contexts in particular. So we'll ask Martin and Jamie to speak first, um, maybe for around 20, 25 minutes each, um, and then we'll go to a Q&A. So please, while, while um, while they're speaking, feel free to put your questions in the yeah. chat. Otherwise, you can just ask them at the end. Cooler will be hosting the, the Q&A at the end. Yeah. We've left an hour and a half for this conversation, but um, you know, we, we, we'll see how we get on with the Q&A. Uh, but I'm sure there'll, there'll be a lot of uh, questions raised by, by the two discussions. So just to say thanks again to both of you and um, perhaps Martin, could we start with you? Is that OK? Yeah, sure. I think that probably makes sense in terms of running order as well. I think mine's a bit more general and then uh, James will be sort of getting more specific, I think. So let me just, I'll try and share my screen. Uh, it done? And while you're doing that, Martin, can I just ask, is it Yemi or Kula? Are we recording this? Um, oh yeah, we are, I can see it started. Yep. Yes, we are. Okay, yes. so we're recording, thanks. Are you seeing that okay? Yeah. And just to check, does, does that advance for you? Yeah, yeah, cool, looks great. good. It doesn't always work, so I thought I'd test it out. <laughs> cool, great. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, OER, but also I think kind of more open education in general. Um, and I think to give us perhaps some some provocations or thoughts around you know, where does openness 
as a principle and as an approach sit in dealing with crises. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. So um, just to say about me, what I do, uh, just in case you don't know me, uh, so I'm a professor here in IET at the Open University. Uh, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm the director of the OER Hub, uh, which is a, a research team that looks at OER uh, and uh, aspects of open education. I'm also the chair of the Open Programme, and I'll talk a bit about that later, which is our multidisciplinary degree. So students can choose from uh, many different modules and, and create their own degree pathways. And I think that's an aspect of openness in education that we don't want to talk about. Um, so we come to that. And you can find me there on Twitter, and uh, that's my blog there if you want to follow up on any of this stuff. Um, I haven't been through what we call the online pivot during the uh, the pandemic when nearly all education shifted online. I think that's kind of as someone who works in educational technology and um, open education, it kind of really brought home lots of things, I think, to me. Um, and I did a lot of work during online pivot trying to help other institutions and practitioners understand how to you know, deliver good online education. And what happened was education technology moved from often the periphery to centre stage. So I have lots of colleagues who are education technologists, who are information technologists. And suddenly they went from not being able to get get a meeting with their own supervisor to being called up by the principal or the vice chancellor and saying, quick, what do we do? How do we do all this stuff? You know? And so there's this kind of very sudden shift. And I think uh, UNESCO said, so I think at one point, 85 percent of the world's population was having its education delivered online. So kind of really massive shift in what we did in terms of online teaching. Um, but it was interesting because although in some ways it saved higher education and all education by being able to carry on in a way, it also revealed a lot of ignorance about online education. So we have quotes like this one I've got here from a, an article in higher education, which is like, the main reason why distance learning revolution didn't replace the traditional model is that online learning just isn't as good. And what, what you saw, and I think we've seen this even more since we've gone back to face to face, um, is what you call the, the lecture deficit model. So the face to face lecture is deemed to be the absolute pinnacle of all education and nothing else to compete and anything else is just lacking that because it's not the same as that so delivering lectures online isn't as good as being a face-to-face -face, but also just delivering any form of online learning is deemed not to be as good and we've had lots of headlines here in the UK and I'm sure you've had them similar where you are where um, education ministers have been saying people must get back to teaching face-to-face -face. they were going to find people if they carried on doing online education so this whole kind of rhetoric around online education being somehow deficient or, or even harmful for people. So I think so that was really interesting. I think as an educational technologist, yeah, yeah. I um in, in 1999 uh, when I was you know you a long time ago, I developed our first big, big online course, um, and we had something like 15,000 students. You know, so we know that it works since then. You know, so. Uh, and I think what that does is that's revealed a kind of real lack of alternative models for how people think about uh, education. They only have the, um, the the lecture as a model. And I think what was interesting was um, for me was how does what did the pandemic reveal about fragility in the higher education system as a whole, as a system? Um, and there are a number of things that, that, that it highlighted. One was that it's really it's based on bringing people to one location, the campus. And you might have multiple locations, but generally you bring people to a campus location. Uh, and there are these kind of real crunch points in the system, such as exams. And when you couldn't get people to exams, everything fell apart. They didn't know how to assess people, all these kind of things. Um, and all the aspects of edu education, so whether it's the, the, um, the student accommodation, where you have the lectures, you know, the computer uh, resource rooms, the library, the tutorial discussion rooms, they're all co-located. Um, and so as soon as that that location was no more, no longer accessible, it all these different aspects of higher education fell apart. Um, and also it's often reliant on other fragile systems. So uh, here in the UK, and we've had similar wherever you are, um, people take A-levels, then go into higher education. And when the A-level systems, they couldn't do the exams, they didn't know how to kind of filter people into higher education. So it was based on other fragile systems, a kind of interconnection. Um, and I think there's been a kind of feeling that I've seen, I don't know if you've seen it too, is that now that the pandemic has largely passed, and you know, I don't want to belittle the fact that you know COVID-19 is still a factor for lots of people, 
but now, now that it's largely passed, um, I think lots of people in higher education have sort of gone like, phew, I'm glad that's over, let's get back to normal. Um, and are just trying to ignore what, what the pandemic revealed about the, the higher education system. But I think it's, it's clear that it's not just the pandemic. You know, in the UK and elsewhere, we're going through a real cost of living crisis you know, where um, heating and, and, and the power is going to cost people a lot more. What does that mean for, for universities? Can they afford to keep all their buildings going? Uh, what does it mean for students who are living you know, often with not a lot of money? Uh, but it's, you know, so, so that's another crisis we're having to deal with. We're dealing with conflict globally, um, and that's leading to, to, to migrants and shutdown of many institutions. Uh, we're doing work, for instance, with universities in Ukraine. Um, but also, it's not just about these kind of big global things. There's individual crises, and often university systems have been quite inflexible at dealing with people having individual crises. You know, it's like unless you've got a serious illness in the family, then you know try getting an extension on an exam or those kind of things and we're just very kind of inflexible I think in our whole systems and living in such a globalized world I think it demonstrates very clearly over the past few years that you know, a, a crisis in one area very quickly affects all of us and so the pitch I want to make is that higher education just as a whole system needs to be much more robust than it is you can't just carry on as, as the way it's done and to finally come around to the OER, the openness part, I think openness plays a key part in, in making it more robust. Uh, I think we can think of this on a number of different levels. So uh, the first one is to continue this view at the kind of systemic level. Um, and you can think about other systems that are designed to be robust. And a kind of very obvious example is the internet. You know, it was designed as a system that would survive nuclear war and you could still carry on. And there were kind of three design features that made it robust. First was that it was open, so anything could be connected up to it. You didn't need to be a specialised uh, computer hub to kind of join it. Any tool could join the internet. It was distributed um, so that uh, if, if any one part was taken out, it could find other flows of information around it. And it was decentralised. There wasn't kind of one main hub where the action took place. So I think you can take those as design principles for building robust systems. So we might think of that in higher education as so the first those openness, uh, you know, you can remix open resources so you don't need to develop all your own content and allows you to create new courses or, or adapt those courses very quickly. And I'll talk more about uh, OER later. Uh, at the Open University, we're open entry. We don't require students to undertake an A-levels or other things to come and join and study with us. So therefore, it's independent of other systems. Um, you can talk about open source software that's self-hosted. You don't need to rely on other providers to give it to you. Um, and open access in terms of publications, open access in terms of uh, data, those kind of things. So, for instance, open access really came to the fore during the uh, during the pandemic because suddenly lots of libraries weren't accessible to students, and they didn't have lots of that lots of their resources online. Uh, and whereas they've been recommending books or journals that are available in the library, students then couldn't access them. As well as open access uh, resources can be accessed by anyone. Uh, distributed, so in, in the open university model, we've got a distributed model, uh, and I'm not suggesting everyone becomes an open university, but just as a kind of example. So we have associate lecturers, part-time lecturers who are distributed around the country, um, and our students are distributed, they work from home, study from home or from work, wherever, so they're not all bringing them to one place. Uh, we do have a central campus, but academics can similarly work um, wherever they are and so can support staff so it was impacted much less by the closure of a central campus by having these all these roles within the system distributed uh, and and it's decent decentralized in quite an interesting way i think you can think about um a lot of our study with uh the open university takes place asynchronously so you don't need to be at a certain place at a certain time and that meant when people's lives were suddenly impacted very dramatically they could fit their study around that change. And this goes back to the idea of, I think, individual flexibility and dealing with individual crises, when it's kind of very time-based and, and, and synchronous, that makes it much more difficult. And also it's very team-based in terms of how we develop and deliver um, courses. So it's not reliant on one person. So if that person becomes ill, you know, the, it doesn't have necessarily an impact on delivery. And I think we can think about um, this robustness at the course level as well. And this is where I'll talk about OER. So why use OER in course development? First of all, they're openly licensed. You don't have to pay for them. You can reuse them in different contexts. 
you can adapt them, adapt them to your own context. So if you say it doesn't quite suit me, but if I change this bit over here, it makes sense. They are usually good quality, depending on where you get them from. Uh, there's a good range available of open educational resources, and we can debate what we mean by open educational resources. Some people say it has to have, meet certain criteria, for instance, have learning objectives, and for other people, it's any resource that's openly licensed uh, that can be used in education, such as a, a YouTube video. Um, and I think what it allows us to do is, uh, as an educator, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You, know, you can just take something that, that people have done over here, and what you can do is focus on support and activity and providing context. You don't need to provide the, the straightforward explanation that depend on your discipline, but you can say, here's some content, read that. Now, what you do, what you do is then provide the activity around it, like in groups, go away and discuss this and, and you know, whatever. Those kind of things. So it allows, I think, educators to focus on the things that they really need to focus on. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about open learning. You, you may have uh, had briefings on open learning already, so uh, forgive me if I'm repeating anything. Um, but at the Open University, we have OpenLearn, uh, our site, um, openly licensed content. Uh, we usually have around 8 million visitors a year, so it's kind of a very popular site. During the pandemic, uh, traffic increased you know, by about 500 percent. Suddenly everyone was coming there. A lot of that was uh, people with time in their hands coming here to learn. But also a lot of it was educators. We, for instance, we have courses on about how to take just teaching online so that they would come to study that or just come here to take you know, if they were an arts history lecturer to find some resources about arts history that they could then use in their online courses. And it's got pretty widespread uh, recognition amongst the UK population. Um, so uh, you can come there, you can use it for any of these things. So you can study free courses, uh, explore different subjects, uh, get badges, you do badges, courses and different things. Uh, and it's all openly licensed. Uh, it's, uh, uh, Creative Commons, uh, non-commercial license, uh, and most of the um, disciplines you want are covered there, and it's you can download it in a number of different formats. So, you know, there are many other OER repositories out there. I'm just uh, bigging up the Open Universities one, but I think it's, it's an interesting place to start and to look for these again. If I wanted to create an open course or an online course about a particular subject, you know, I don't need to create all of the content. I can go to places like this and find that content and reuse it and adapt it. To think about this robustness at the individual level, I think you think about individual educators. Um, in North America in particular, uh, there's been widespread adoption of open textbooks. As so these are textbooks you can take uh, that are openly licensed and they've covered most of the kind of um, major topics at, at sort of 101 level, the introduction level, so statistics, you know, chemistry, those kind of things. Um, and again, you can take these books and adapt them so they suit your context better. And they're really high quality books. Um, and I think related to that, so this is, these are things that open OER and open content allows you to do differently. So um, open pedagogy, for instance. So um, this book here, Open Anthology of Early American Literature uh, by Robin DeRosa, she took that book, it was a, an openly licensed uh, textbook, and she got her students to contribute uh, new content to it so, so different people could be represented and I think that plays a lot into this idea of kind of decolonizing the curriculum as well and if, if we have this curriculum that's kind of very based around certain perspectives then we can co-create new content with the students and I think that really changes our relationship of the student to a textbook it's not just something you receive but rather something you interact with and generate that knowledge yourself uh, and we've developed at the Open University uh, a course um, called uh, Making Your Learning Count which students bring content to, from places like OpenLearn and, and MOOCs and FutureLearn um, that they already have and bring that content with them and then try to generate con uh, connections between that content. So it's about kind of trying to find interdisciplinary skills. So that kind of really allows students to bring in informal learning and begin to formalise that learning. Um, and I'll sort of end thinking about the kind of institutional level of these robustness. So I mentioned the open degree earlier. Um, and it's the biggest degree in, in the UK, and it used to be the only degree that we offered at the Open University before we did name degrees. So the Open degree allows uh, students to combine modules from, from different places. Now, there are some prerequisites, and you can't just take a third level of maths course without and taking some uh, stuff before and to understand it, but generally students combine over 250 different modules. 
uh, into, into their own degree path. And that's really powerful for lots of students. They often start down a particular subject area that they didn't like. They, they don't want to lose that study, but they want to go in a different area. Their job changes or the world changes and suddenly they're interested in different things. And they can combine these, these modules to, to suit their own purposes. And they really do. You know, I thought when I first took over this role, I thought there'd be like two or three pathways that actually everyone took. But actually it's not. It's, they take all the different pathways you can possibly imagine. And I think that's interesting because what this demonstrates is openness in a different aspect, in openness in, in the degree structure, in your pathway structure. And that's particularly possible because a lot of our study is asynchronous. It becomes really difficult to do this if you're trying to organise different timetables where people have to be at different places you know, at the same time. So it's really difficult for campus universities to do, but for online and open universities, we can have this kind of really, uh, varied degree. And I think that's really powerful for lots of students. Um, and I think institutions really need to think about this at the institutional level, about how they encourage this and reward staff. It's all very well saying we want, but often universities will say things like, we want innovation and then put in place lots of systems that discourage innovation. So I think you kind of need to have systems in place that will encourage lecturers and staff to adopt OER. You know, they won't be penalised for using someone else's stuff in their teaching or to create OER and share that in the same way that we encourage people to share research findings through articles or to use open textbooks and save students money, for instance, through the use of that, or to explore different forms of pedagogy through open pedagogy. Uh, and they also need in place um, technical systems and uh, admin systems that encourage different aspects of good online design, which allow for this kind of openness and this, this flexibility. So I developed a, a blog post series recently about designing good online courses and I covered these five aspects but they can be different ones I mean, how you do group work assessment uh, learning design how synchronous or asynchronous it is and how many how much open resources you use in your course and I think you can think of it as a set of sliders if you like so you can have the sort of face-to-face -face equivalent when you come in online which might be doing an online lecture or there might be some fully online version which is like use of OER and, those kind of things. and you can think for any particular context, you might move those sliders up and down for what you want to do. Uh, and I think universities need to kind of help uh, help academics do that and put in place, for example, varied assessment formats that don't always rely on, a, on exam, for instance. So um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. I think I'm OK, good. Uh, in conclusion, and I think, you know, hopefully we'll come back to some of these after the next presentation, we can discuss the sort of pictures of where openness fits in with this. Um, I think we need to kind of go forward just seeing crises as the norm, if you like, as part of higher education. And higher education needs to be much better uh, adapting to those, much more flexible for the student and for the uh, at a kind of systemic level, much more robust, I think. Really. Um, and online is going to be part of that flexible mix, I think. It doesn't mean everything has to be online, you know, but I think we can shift some things online quickly. Uh, and I think openness needs to be part of that mix. And those two things are related, and whether it's use of OER, uh, open pedagogy, open textbooks, or uh, open courses as, as we've developed. Um, and that's it from me. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Martin. That was um, that was a fascinating talk and um, given, given us a lot of food for thought, um, which we'll come back to in the Q&A section. But perhaps um, to to go into a bit more detail now um, over the 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 use of OERs with with refugee populations, um, I can turn to Jamie. Jamie, are you ready to to start sharing your your slides? For sure. Yep. Let me just get it loaded. That should show up there. Is that is that showing up? Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thanks so much. And thank you, Martin. That was fantastic and uh, very helpful also to set the context of OERs so I can um, not go not not spend time on explaining what they are and, and talk about some of this, these, this specific work. So um, that was fantastic. So my name is Jamie Alexander. I'm the executive director of Learning Equality. We're an ed tech nonprofit that's committed to enabling equitable access to educational opportunity. I'm honored to be here with you all and privileged to have been working for the past few years alongside the UNHCR Connected Education team to design and iterate on quality digital learning experiences for refugees and host community learners. 
I'm also joined here today by several of my colleagues, and I particularly want to acknowledge all of the work that Lauren Lichtman and Karini Diaz put into helping to prepare today's presentation. So as you're listening to the discussion today, and potentially as some questions we can come back to as we uh, have some, some group discussions, there are a couple of questions I'd like you to keep at the back of your mind and then to share back on later as we have those discussions. First is, who is currently able to most benefit from OER? And what barriers might be holding others back? Second, what can we do to boost equitable OER adoption and impact, particularly for refugees? start with a bit of background. Learning equality is uh, just wanted to start with sharing some positionality and context for our work and, and my position within that. Learning equality is a US based nonprofit. Uh, we do support learning globally. Uh, in contrast with the, I know there's a, a post secondary focus here, just to acknowledge we do primarily design for K through 12 environments and have focused our efforts there. So our experience in higher education has been fairly limited and focused specifically on preparedness for higher education um, coming out of secondary, uh, as well as supplemental support with introductory courses during that transition. Our focus on OER and curriculum alignment has therefore also been focused within that space on K through 12 to supplement other materials that are available in a learning environment and to support blended learning models which is a different approach to alignment at the higher education level where it's maybe more course and degree uh, based. Uh, that said, um, hopefully we'll have some um, relevant and important things to share given the openness of these products and tools that we create. We have been able to learn from the experiences of organizations around the world using digital resources in a multitude of languages, subject areas and grade levels. And in doing this work and in sharing with you today, I also want to acknowledge my own positionality and specific life experiences as an educated white male based in the global north and note that while I'll do my best to share lessons learned through my relationships and my collaborations with refugees, I don't claim to speak on their behalf or to represent their experiences and identities. And I hope you'll continue to seek out opportunities to hear from them directly, as I know you already are. So in working with UNHCR, we've identified these global trends in refugee settings as it relates to the use of digital tools for learning. Connectivity, while often present to some degree, is frequently unreliable, slow or expensive. And there's an increasing prevalence of smartphones and other devices. And a priority placed on staying connected and in communication with one another and their communities. There's an acknowledgement of digital skills as vital and relevant. Frequently, there are limitations in access to relevant educational resources more broadly. There's a high prevalence of out of school and idle youth, particularly in contexts where secondary school capacity is overloaded. And there's a high demand for opportunities for training, learning and upskilling. And a strong need for content in multiple languages that's been aligned to national curricular standards. And that's an area we're also going to be delving deeper into today. So connectivity and internet access have always been one of the core obstacles that learning equality has focused on. When we started this work in 2013, still only one third of the world was online. And that presented a huge barrier to equitable access to the benefits of online resources and opportunities and many of the, the types of benefits of open educational resources that Martin was talking about earlier. Now, 10 years later, nearly two thirds of the world's population is online. So that's definitely progress, but still a huge gap. There are huge infrastructural and affordability barriers that remain. And in particular, if we're keeping equity front and center, we need to dig a bit deeper into these statistics as well. If we disaggregate connectivity rates by countries' income levels, a stark and persistent pattern becomes clear. While 90% of the population in high income countries is online, that's the green bar on the right, in the lowest income countries as of 2020, uh, so you know, imagine as the pandemic hits, everybody's trying to shift to online learning. In these lowest income countries, still only 21% of the population was connected to the internet. And these same countries also face many of the biggest challenges overall in resourcing their educational systems and also serve as host countries for large portions of the world's refugees. So learning equality began collaborating with UNHCR around five years ago 
as we were seeing many of the same challenges in our work and wanted to join forces as we work towards solutions. We've now collaborated in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Jordan, and Libya, and are preparing for work in some additional countries as part of the Instant Network Schools expansion, for instance, in Mozambique and South Sudan. And that's building further on top of our joint collaborations with Vodafone Foundation as well. For the purposes of today's discussion, a significant focus of our joint work has been around understanding how digital content can be used in these environments and how we can streamline the process of curriculum alignment to enhance the adoption and usage of digital materials to support learning. At Learning Equality, we take a unique approach to building technology to enrich learning without the internet. We design solutions that are open source and adaptable to specific learning contexts and supported to scale through a do-it-yourself adoption model or with our direct support. As part of this adaptability, we're focused on making openly licensed learning resources relevant and accessible, supporting educators at every step of the intervention and working within existing infrastructure whenever possible. And lastly, our data collection methods are designed to scale with limited connectivity so that data you may not normally be able to receive from those without the internet is now possible to collect to support ongoing implementation, uh, improvement and deepening our impact. Calibri is Learning Equality's adaptable set of open solutions that's specially designed to support offline first teaching and learning, running on a wide variety of possible hardware and able to sync content and data between devices, even when completely offline, support to support a wide variety of implementation models. I think it's important to emphasize that this isn't just about distributing content, but also supporting rich blended learning models uh, where teachers can be supporting students, having real time access to data to understand where they're struggling, assign content to them, monitor their progress, directly intervene to help them overcome barriers. Uh, so to support a rich um, educational ecosystem, uh, even when no internet is available. And Calibri is more than just a single product. Um, at the center of that is this learning platform, but it's an ecosystem of products um, that's centered around that offline first learning platform, but is also enabled by a toolkit of open resources around how to take advantage of the ecosystem and a curricular tool, Calibri Studio, to support the process of organizing learning resources, which includes a large library of aggregated open educational resources that we've pulled in and made offline ready from sources around the internet, as well as those contributed by the community. In this curated and openly licensed educational content library, which is available in a wide variety of languages, academic and non-academic subject areas and grade levels, uh, focused again on K through 12, um, are, are a wide variety of sources, uh, a, uh, a total of 121 different channels um, and 159,000 unique resources across many different languages. Uh, we continue to build out this library, responding to the needs that we hear from our user community, as well as working with them to integrate uh, locally created content to uh, continue to increase the, the diversity and relevance of the, of the library. In doing this work, we focused on different characteristics of open educational resources, and particularly the fact that they can be, as Martin was saying, remixed and reused. And as part of that, we've always been aware that content was developed with a particular context in mind, but it may still have the potential to be used elsewhere outside of its original context. So we've been thinking about this concept of portability, which focuses on how accessible, adaptable, and contextualizable the content is so that it can be used across a variety of contexts. And this isn't just about indexing content so it can be tracked and, uh, and discovered, it also means thinking about licensing, as we've talked about, as Martin was talking about as well, um, and the potential for reuse, whether the material, also whether the materials have a reliance on the internet, uh, such as containing links to third party sites um, or relying other online resources, and whether its use also requires additional materials that may not be available in some of these low resource contexts, such as particular proprietary software or laboratory equipment uh, or other uh, materials. So we continue to advocate for awareness around the need for consideration of portability in this sense for those who are creating, funding or adapting OERs in order to promote more equitable access and impact to these resources around the world. 
Another key component of our ecosystem is supporting this remixing and curriculum alignment process. Materials that are drawn from the many sources in our library, along with additional materials uploaded by users, can be aligned according to relevant national curricular standards using our Calibri Studio platform, and then easily published for distribution and then use offline within the learning platform. Through these approaches, we've reached millions of learners across over 220 countries and territories, supporting diverse learning environments through a wide range of access modalities, including self-paced learning in stationary computer labs over local networks, uh, rotation models in classrooms with roving sets of tablets and a laptop server that connect over a local hotspot connection, flipped classroom models with both local and cloud servers that are kept in sync um, so that people can be learning synchronously together in the same space as well as on their own when they're away and have some intermittent connectivity, as well as autonomous learning at home and on the go through zero rated access through collaborations with telecommunications providers. Some of the specific access modalities that we've used uh, alongside UNHCR in the work with refugees include working with government to provide broad access through both online country level servers, as well as access through local uh, community hotspots. Installing in computer labs in schools or in community centers and other facilities with the support of trained experts and advocates and preloading the learning platform and line content onto low cost Android tablets distributed for use at home. And this specifically came into the fore uh, during the pandemic uh, to ensure um, some, some level of continuity of learning. And then roving backpack kits is another model that's been used within our collaborations with a battery powered server and several tablets uh, being carried in a backpack and then brought and used with youth in areas where they're gathering. And to give a sense of how we approach working in a new context and to understand how Calibri can best be leveraged or to explore what other edtech tools might be better suited if it's not the best tool for, for our context, um, just wanted to share a few of the questions we discuss with partners in the community to kind of see how the contextualization um, process uh, begins. So first, what's the existing infrastructure that can be leveraged so we can see what we're working within? What learning resources are available in the language of instruction or that are created locally? Are those resources aligned to national curricular standards or are there other similar alignment work um, efforts that have been done um, that could be leveraged to uh, support uh, discovery of content within that context? What's the potential within the learning environment for educator support of the learners and then of the, for those educators, what's their existing familiarity with teaching, leveraging technology, or more broadly, the digital literacy skills? And then what's the intended user journey for a student educator and administrator? How are, what's the intention of how they're going to flow between uh, platform and other learning activities and uh, accomplish their learning objectives? So that that was a bit of uh, background and context, hopefully, to give you a sense of kind of the nature and context of our work. But now let's dig in a bit further in the motivation for curriculum alignment in particular, and then what that actually looks like in practice. One of the critical aspects, as we've talked about, of OERs is their ability to be remixed. And we continue to see strong needs that justify why curriculum alignment is an important area for ongoing focus. First is the, the huge volume of, of amazing content, but also a very quality um, that exists. So a huge uh, body of materials that potentially could be drawn from. Uh, and so discovery um, is, is uh, ability to quickly discover what's most relevant is critical. Um, there are multiple parallel initiatives to create and localize content, um, which continue, con contributes to the size and, and diversity and complexity of, that, of these repositories. Um, Educators, students and caregivers can struggle to map content to the curriculum and particularly given the limited time that educators often have with access to the technology and for preparing for their lessons. Um, just the searching through these large repositories of content um, in these in these contexts can be a big challenge. And especially given limited and inconsistent connectivity and which is why it's important to ensure that we have ways to bring this content offline. But also when you're bringing content offline, you're making decisions in advance around the specific sets of content that are going to be brought in for use in a particular context. And if it hasn't been pre-aligned, you can't 
quickly determine what's going to be most relevant and make sure that it's going to be available offline uh, for for selection and use uh, by educators and, and learners. So what does it mean for digital content to be aligned to a curriculum? To just put it simply, it's taking a specific learning objective or need and then matching that to content from a digital library and then sharing those materials in a way that's organized, that it's accessible and usable. This slide distills the actual process of curriculum alignment that we've identified in collaboration with um, with experts who focus on this area, um, organized into these six distinct steps. So first is selecting and formatting the standards themselves, including digitizing them if needed, vetting the content for relevance and suitability to the specific standards, matching the content up to the right topics and objectives within that curriculum, determining the right level and audience for the materials, and then envisioning how they'll actually be used by educators and learners towards the learning objectives in case additional contextualization or lesson plans or other context uh, or materials are needed alongside them. And then sharing out the products of that work for use, feedback and subsequent iteration. So then after alignment takes place, it means that the outputs can be used for a variety of purposes, including being incorporated into lesson plans, supporting supplemental learning and so forth. What we know overall is that when there's limited time for lesson planning, non-aligned sources result in lower adoption, and in some cases, negative perceptions of digital repositories as a whole, since the OERs can then be perceived as time consuming, irrelevant, or overwhelming. So Learning Equality and UNHCR have worked with curriculum design consultants and other partners to align digital content to a variety of curricula. One such concerted effort in 2020 included the alignment of content from 20 different sources in three languages to the curricula of three different countries. And it's again, it's important to note here that this is focused on supporting supplemental learning and not replacing what is already happening and exists in classrooms, um, but to supplement and provide additional opportunities and, and modalities for learning. So now I want to dig in a bit on uh, some of the work that we've been doing alongside UNHCR and other partners to enhance the process of curriculum alignment. Uh, given the importance of curriculum alignment, but also how time consuming and resource intensive it can be, uh, we've been collaborating uh, around how we can enhance that through semi-automated support to streamline the process. So to start, we considered how educators and learners otherwise find content when it hasn't been specifically organized or aligned. So we worked with a group of teachers in Kakuma Refugee Camp in a series of co-design activities to understand challenges, approaches, and opportunities to, to navigating and understanding content and discovering content. And this helped to inform ways that metadata is presented and content is organized, but also further motivated the need for investing in the process of curricular alignment in order to make materials as discoverable and useful as possible. Through this, the problem statement we settled on was, how can we create a tool that helps to automate the mapping of digital learning resources to national curricula in an effective and efficient manner? And again, noting the lack of time, often limited capacity or personnel or tools for some of those prerequisite steps. So the kind of meta question that this was all uh, going towards supporting is, how is the next generation of learning solutions going to ensure equitable reach? We then led further consultations with key stakeholders, including content developers, curriculum designers, ministries of education and curricular bodies, donor governments, private sector, machine learning experts, refugees, and educators. Building on the initial consultations, we then ran a design sprint to start designing a tool, followed by a hackathon to prototype it. And there have been many useful learnings and standalone tools we've built along the way that we've been sharing out as public goods. In all of this work, we're taking a two-pronged approach. First, through expert enablement, we fund and support subject matter experts who know the country teaching environment, as well as uh, in collaboration with curricular bodies, to match materials to learning objectives through specialized tools, such as Calibre Studio. And then second, we're working towards a semi-automated system to help streamline that expert process. We use data from previously aligned materials to build and train machine learning based tools to suggest high relevance materials for particular contexts in a curriculum. There are many stages of the curriculum alignment process that we considered for potential automation, but we focused in on two key areas of highest potential. 
one of the core prerequisite activities to di is to digitize the curricular documents in the first place. So they can then be leveraged within these platforms and tools. Now, often these are distributed only in paper formats in these books covering different sections of the curriculum. And so um, bringing those into standardized digital formats um, is an important step in, in this process of aligning content to those standards. So based on existing metadata standards and initiatives, we engaged on a, a, a project to develop a blueprint for digitizing curricular standards to support exchange and reuse of that data and avoid duplication of the time consuming process across multiple parties as well. We also outline means for exchanging and vetting curriculum alignment information between content repositories and across learning platforms. So what this means is that we now have a clear way to represent machine readable curricular data and that can then be exported and used for other purposes, including to support the backbone for this automation. The second main area for automation, which is where we're focusing in now, is matching particular objectives within a curriculum to the most relevant open educational resources from a large multilingual repository. So just to make this a bit more concrete, consider the specific place with uh, this specific place uh, here um, within the taxonomy of a national curriculum. So the goal then is to recommend to the content curation expert the top content that would help to support teaching or learning that specific content or concept or objective. So in this case, that could mean giving a high ranking to a video on geometric constructions and a lower ranking to an exercise on the volume of cylinders. The content curator can then review these recommended matches and uh, that uh, rather than needing to dig in and search through the entire library manually and select those that meet their criteria. The choices they make then feed back in to further training the recommendation system in, a, in an iterative improvement loop. So up next, we're finalizing a data set uh, based on this large repository of content and alignment work that we've uh, gathered for conducting a machine learning competition to engage the broader community with support from UNHCR Innovation and other partners. And the goal is to improve on these initial prototypes that we've built and the baseline results we've been able to achieve and discover creative new approaches to leveraging state-of-the-art language models and new machine learning techniques to improve the performance before we move towards bringing this into production. And there are many ways that you can get involved in the initiative, depending on what you're able and interested to contribute. Uh, we encourage all of you to read the report, or at least the executive summary, um, to understand more around why digitizing curriculum standards matters. Um, if you have access to a national curriculum through your work and collaborations, uh, we would love to see that uh, in order to help build out the growing repository and support these digitization and alignment efforts. If you're a curriculum designer, we'd love to, you to work with us to conduct manual alignment of OERs to national curricula to support educators and learners and also to generate data uh, to support the effort. If you're a machine learning specialist, we'd love you to get involved in the upcoming competition or engage in other ways. And for everyone here, let us know if you want to join this coalition of actors working to make this prototype a reality. And so thank you much for the uh, so much for the time and attention, and we look forward to further discussion today and beyond, as well as hopefully some deeper collaborations. Brilliant. Thank you so much, thank Jamie. Yeah, I was, I was just going to hand over to you, Kula, so <laughs> yes, go ahead. Yes, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. Thank you, Frankie. Uh, and I know that you have to leave early, so it's um, it's fine. You will try to um, follow on your bicycle on the way home. So thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, I would like to really open the floor to our guests. Uh, if you have any questions for Martin, if you have any questions for Jamie, please um, raise your hand or unmute and you can ask the question directly to them. Or, and I can see that we have a couple of questions on the chat box that we can pick up uh, immediately while you're thinking of your questions. Um, so I think the first one is for you and Jamie, there is a, a question from Ulla asking, how are teachers trained to use Colibri? Um, and I can relate to this to this question as well. It's a question that I had myself, actually. You know, how how can we support teachers um, yeah. in this idea of in this process of remixing, adapting, uh, reusing OERs uh, for education? Yeah. And well, I can see that you you are on camera and you are on mute. Would you like to would you like to say something more about related to your question? 
Yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot. I just see that you uh, you put the camera on. Yeah, so that I can discuss. So thank you very much for the the the, the, ins the first inspiring uh, presentation, and then what uh, was presented around Colibri. I'm I'm just working with teachers, and I'm I'm at present digging into how to avail teacher professional development through OERs. Mm -hmm how to make sure that it is accessible to them. And to be honest, I'm, I'm struggling to find uh, impact assessment or any um, anything around how teachers effectively get the training. And also for Colibri, I was looking this morning in on your website. I, I didn't see anything related to how you prepare the teachers to adopt it. So maybe it's, it's in and so I'm curious. About it. Thank you. Yep, uh, no, fantastic. And this is an area that we think very deeply about and have um, team capacity around um, around supporting um, the the general model. So we have we have a two pronged model for implementation. One is through close partnerships where we're working with a partner in the implementation of a project, and the other is through this do it yourself adoption model. So in the, the model where we're working closely with the partner, um, it's often through a training of trainers model. And so we do trainings, our, our team does trainings where we work closely with uh, the implementing partner. Um, that may be an NGO. In some cases, we've trained the teaching, the teacher training bodies within a country um, to then uh, support the rollout um, through their own, to incorporate into their own um, existing teacher, like um, in-service or pre-service uh, teacher training uh, programs. Um, in support of that, we have also developed a toolkit of training materials and guidance um, that is it's a bit buried on the website. We're currently in the process of revamping the website, but uh, we do have that, um, which is used both within our own trainings and is then further uh, taken and adapted and, and used um, by the, the trainers themselves for their particular context, as well as in a do-it-yourself model. So that can, that's an uh, openly licensed um, set of, of training materials and toolkit of guidance materials that others have also taken and remixed and adapted to their own context and incorporated their own materials into and then used in their own teacher training. So generally it's a, it's a you know an approach towards supporting directly where we can and also as a way to understand and learn and, and develop um, develop the materials themselves in collaboration with the partners we work with. Um, and then releasing that as an open toolkit that can be further adapted, built on, and, and receive feedback um, from others to, as they incorporate into their own context. Um, in some cases, Calibri is also used directly for teacher training. So within our trainings, we use Calibri, you know, trying to um, uh, use the use the demonstrate the tool and the pedagogy of the blended learning models within the training process itself, so that it's uh, it's you know it serves as an example of the the target uh, the target pedagogies. But uh, then also it has been used specifically for teacher training. So in some cases, our tools are used to train teachers, even if the technology is not going to be used within the classroom. The technology can be used to help um, upskill and support the process of professional development itself. So that's another use case that we've seen. Um, there have been several impact evaluations and assessments um, demonstrating impact, but I don't think any that specifically focused on training. Um, so that would be an interesting area to delve into further on research, and it's an area of our active ongoing um, investment of, of uh, energy and iterative development as well. Thank you very much. Um, so Jamie, if I can. Yeah, yeah please, please learn my colleague. Um, any data about the use of the toolkit? Or it is not yet available? The so the toolkit, yeah, the toolkit in particular, we have um, you know more anecdotal evidence of how it's used. It's um, you know because it's taken offline and used offline, we don't have a full picture of how of all the different contexts it's used in. But um, we do have uh, you know a lot of feedback and iteration from the direct trainings that we're involved with. Um, sorry, I think my colleague Lauren had something to add as well because she's more closely involved with that work as well. Yeah, it was only just to briefly add on. I think. Um, so yes to what Jamie said around the anecdotal evidence, like we get one of the ways that we improve on the toolkit is by organizations sharing back with us how they've adapted it for their own use and us then incorporating that in terms of like a case study or an example of how it's been used. So it's not necessarily an evaluation um, per se, but it is a demonstration of um, how they've used it alongside their own evaluation of their programming. Um, in our trainings ourselves, we also do 
like exit slips and, and other things to kind of evaluate what happens in the training. But frankly, like to understand if it's effective, you really need to see how it's used in the program itself. And so that's something like Jamie said that we work on through our individual programs. I think one thing that we continue to find is that there's definite improvements in digital literacy skills when using Calibri um, and how to blend technology um, into learning environments and uh, improve co educator confidence. So that's something we're working on evaluating more closely. But what we have seen is that there is still, there are still other general professional teacher to professional development needs that happen alongside Calibri that are still needed. So what we're working on too is not um, us kind of replicating the great work of others that really have like our specialists in how to um, train teachers, but rather supplement how it pertains to Calibri and then draw linkages between those two resources so that um, because what all of our, our uh, a lot of our projects are showing is that there's still that need for ongoing professional development. And so we provide even in our toolkit resources on peer mentoring structures, and sometimes we help to facilitate that um, to be able to support in that effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you very much, Jamie. Any other questions um, or any comments or any thoughts that you may have um, that are related to the two presentations today? If I can, could I just follow up with that? Sure. Uh, yes, really good point, actually, I think we did some work with the OER Research Hub and that sort of time to take and adapt content was often a real barrier. Um, a lot of people reported often it would take them as long to find and adapt content as it did just to write it from scratch kind of thing. And I think there's a real return on investment for these things after a while. I think it often takes longer just because it's new, you know, it's a new skill you're developing. But I think we see once people are kind of in that community of reusing OER, open textbooks, they um, they sort of become very adept, adapt, adept, adept, <laughs> adept at adapting stuff very quickly. I think they sort of know where they can go and find stuff and what and how to find what they need from it and adapt it and use it quickly. So it's when I think, think when you're trying to get people to do it initially, there's a kind of real inertia problem about sort of getting over that initial hump about doing it. And, and, and so interesting, we did some work with uh, my colleague, um, Beck Pick might want to come in on this, but we did some work with the um, Open Textbook uh, Consortium and they, one of the things they did was they paid people to do reviews of open textbooks. And by doing those reviews, it sort of made them engage meaningfully with the content, if you like. And once they'd done that, they were then much more likely to um, to adopt those adopt open textbooks and sort of and do a conversion, if you like. I don't know if you want to come in and make that work back. And Martin, can I follow up on this? Because I did I, I really like the your conceptualization, you know, of openness embedded across all the levels of a system. Um, and you know, there are many tensions that are there when you're trying to, to work across levels. Um, and then you also refer to actually systems that may encourage staff to, you know, adapt OER, to create OER. And I just wanted to, I, I, I mean, are there any examples, you know, at international level that actually we see this happening? where actually, you know, you see universities or organizations really uh, putting systems in place to support the, the adoption and creation of OERs. Yeah, it's a good point. So um, a colleague of ours, Rajiv Changiani in uh, Canada, used to be at, uh, where was he before, Beck? <laughs> you know, he just moved to a new university, but he put in place lots of programs about adoption of OER within um, their, their courses and how that could be encouraged. And for a lot of, you know, I did a, a research project a long time ago with um, different colleagues around the world, KPU, that's right, yeah, thank you. Uh, um, and one of the things that often came up was a kind of feeling about a sense of identity as, as an educator um, and whether using someone else's material undermined their authority, you know, and I think people think, you know, I've become, I've worked hard to become a, a university lecturer or whatever, and to go and use someone else's material would seem to kind of undermine my position. And so I think through things like the tenure process or reward process, then universities can really 
encourage that and also legitimize it. So I think you know people like Majid have done really good work in doing that. And I think simply I mentioned BC Campus, who developed lots of open textbooks. They've done lots of work on how to adopt this at a policy level. Okay, thank you. Anyone else that would like to come in and um, share some feedback or any comment from Martin and Jamie or anything related to open education, really, and open education resources? And maybe share examples from your work in, in this area. Well, I can see that you have your hand up, please. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, if no and one maybe. Well, and maybe you, you can tell us also from uh, which organization, which organization you're based? OK, so um, I work with um, um, Childhood Education International as a senior consultant on a project for um, co-creating um, professional development material for teachers in displacement context. And um, so this is the quality holistic learning project for those who might be aware of it. Um, so my question is about this specific term of portability that was mentioned by Jamie. So when we are designing programs that are destined at, at people in, let's say, refugee camps or in remote areas, so how can we make sure that they are really accessible and uh, speaking to the needs of these people and to the way they can uh, make use yeah. of So, um, because we have our own OERs yeah. that are already here, but we want to make sure that they are used and not just um, another OER in the, in the sea of OERs. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can pass to my colleague Lauren to talk a bit about the tool that we've created for assessing portability of, of resources. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so that's a perfect question. So we um, just to, to provide some background, this concept of portability actually came out of our work with UNHCR and working with different governments um, in reviewing and approving OERs that have been aligned to the national curricula and an understanding that at times the type of um, policies around approval um, could be interpreted in different ways. And we wanted to ensure that there was an understanding of um, the different ways in which OERs could be used um, in different contexts, recognizing, as Jamie said, that they might be developed in one place, um, but still have potential for use in another place. Um, and oftentimes, when we're thinking about integration of content within different platforms, we're just thinking about the technical integration. We felt like there was a really large gap that would allow for one to be um, used, um, as you're mentioning. So what we did was um, develop this initial survey, um, this tool, we're calling it the portability assessment tool, and I'll drop it here in the chat. And this is still um, under development. Oh, sorry, I'll drop it in a second. This is still under development, but the idea is that it would be something very quick that you can use for a self-assessment of um, the portability of your own materials. And then based on this, you would get some type of ranking that would provide guidance to you on how to further adapt your tools, uh, your content. So it can either be used at the outset um, of content creation or when looking at the materials that you have now, thinking about what, how reusable and adaptable they actually are. So I encourage you to take a quick look at the, the tool. It takes about five minutes to complete. And really the idea is to spur food for thought around how to further um, higher OERs could be used in different contexts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. Parvati, I could see that you had your hand up. Not sure whether you would like to come in. Yeah, briefly, yeah, thank you very much. I just wanted to say thank you very much for all the talks today. And we are developing uh, open educational resources for education for peace in the African context using um, uh, local values and knowledges of peace. Uh, and we are trying to develop that into some teacher training material, which is also being, I think, with UNESCO. But I am also conscious precisely of this kind of uh, very a uh, small scale, um, very localized responses uh, uh, of of developing these open education resources and definitely concerned about 
how that can be drawn into or, or, or actually avoid repetition of existing teaching. So, um, so I'd love to be part of these conversations because we've got, I think, three or four OERs that we've got money to develop uh, in these contexts. We can change what we do a little bit in order to fit gaps, if that is helpful. Um, uh, uh, we will be hosting these in South Africa, so I think they have got slightly different requirements of in what in terms of what they require from their OERs, but I, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to be able to, if anybody here can, uh, is happy to uh, sort of give us advice on how to make this work in the best possible way to meet a bigger requirement, but also to add to that, please could you, um, yeah, could you get in touch and I will uh, send you my email address here. Yeah, maybe you can add it to the, to the chat box, Parvati. Please. And I think it is related to, you know, concerns that we all have. And I think we have seen this with OERs that, you know, and, and refugees, especially when we have overseas institutions that they develop programs and activities in, in a country or in a, um, in a camp, for example, where they are, they are reusing OERs that are very much based on Western pedagogical models or they are not contextualized at all. And of course, then to remix and adapt, as Martin was saying, it does require lots of work. Um, so um, it is maybe it is part of this idea of developing the skills, uh, but also it's it's a it's a mentality, isn't it? It's an ethos that, especially if we are based in institutions in the global north, that this is a practice that we should be avoiding, uh, and we really need to embed um, these local values, this, the local knowledge, as you say, Parvati. In the in the development of OERs. And to develop it in the global south using local teachers and scholars. What we're trying to do is to actually flip the model and to use the teaching from there in order to develop teaching materials for schools in the UK so that uh, we don't teach about the global south uh, from the global north, but we really use global mm. south knowledges to try and build the knowledge base about the global south in the north. So we're working with the Geographical Association to develop a teaching module on that. But it would be great to think about how this could be networked into or make use of um, and perhaps to uh, yeah, and to see what what you know, what's the best way because we have the resources, we have the staff, but we should really make the best use of this. Um, mm -hmm. So it would be great if you could drop me an email, uh, yeah, with anything that we we should be mindful of. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. Thank you. And it, it looks very fascinating. Are there any examples, Martin? Of uh, I'm not sure if there is any hand up. Sorry, I don't want to dominate the, the questions here. No, I think Ula is a legacy hunt. Is it a legacy hunt, Ula, uh, what I see here? Sorry, I forgot to. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Martin, I would like to uh, maybe pick up and elaborate a bit more on the on what you were saying about the, the make your learning count or, or what we call here at the OU the, the open box, really. Um, and we know we've had discussions in the past uh, and you know how uh, my views of this in terms of the open box being a possibility to actually bridge informal and formal learning. Uh, and especially in the field of refugee education where we have an abundance of informal learning courses um, where um, students often crave for more uh, accredited opportunities, uh, a way to enter the university, uh, but also bring their learning with them in the university. So maybe we can, um, maybe you can pick this up a bit, um, a bit further and um, explain a bit the model uh, a bit more for our guests that are not familiar with our structures and the um, and the modules and the degrees that we are offering. Okay. Yeah. So um, the course has has the Open University catchy code of YXM130. It's called Making a Learning Camp. It's um, 30 credit points and um, in our system, you need 360 points for a degree. 
and it's at level one to the kind of introductory level uh, at Open University. Um, and we've sort of called it, it it's got the sort of name of an, an open box course because there's not a lot of content in it. Um, and so what we do is encourage students to bring their content with them from other places such as Open Learn and Future Learn, where they may have done some informal learning. Um, and then they're encouraged to make connections between that content and the, and the final assessment is around uh, producing an artifact like a, a poster for something where, where they explain it to, to a different audience and that that, um, that process of explaining it helps them sort of see the connections between those things and so it's kind of a really useful model I'm not, and other people have done similar things and I think um, the OER university for instance does something similar I, I think it's a really good example of how we're trying to if you like smooth that pathway into formal learning you know so, so often people will do things like uh, MOOCs or, uh, or study OER and they not really know what the next step is and, and often the next step is sign up for a three-year degree you know so it's, that's which is quite a big step you know so you can come and take this module and perhaps get some some credit for studying it and then decide if you want to then go on and study further so I like to sort of see it as a kind of a a USB port into a university, a kind of way of plugging your stuff into the university and then sort of maybe going on that journey. And it's been uh, uh, very successful. Really. But I, I think that's an example of just the kind of, I'm not just trying to get them to sign up for our course, but the kind of the sort of flexible approach that I think lots of universities have been taking. And similarly, like you know, other universities are beginning to recognise certain MOOCs as, as credit transfer. You can, if you study these MOOCs, they would count as credit that they will recognise them as well. Yeah, and it's quite an innovative model actually, to to be able to bring what you have done elsewhere, um, in your university studies. Anyone else that would like to come in, uh, and share um, any Jack, example or any Jack, experience? Yeah, good question. Sorry, I missed that. Yeah. In the in the text. I'm not sure I can answer it. I'll, perhaps I'll let Jamie go first to answer that, then I'll have a crack. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an excellent question with no perfect answer, obviously, but um, yeah, I think some of the lessons that we've learned around motivation for adoption of OERs, there's often not necessarily resistance, but just slow, like um, slowness of adoption or realizing how it can integrate and, and the full potential and how a shifting of resources can actually save resources um, in the end, but it, it takes a, a kind of a mindset shift to get there. Um, one of the ways that we've seen government get motivated around OER is, you know, they often made a lot of investments in hardware. And so they've got a whole bunch of computers or a whole bunch of tablets that are being distributed, but then realizing that they don't have strong use cases for it in terms of helping to achieve their learning objectives and outcomes. Uh, and so having the potential for larger repositories of content that can be loaded offline or leveraged online for free without additional licensing costs um, in order to effectively realize the investment they made in in hardware is one kind of angle that we've seen one of the challenges we've had is kind of going through the approval process when you're integrating through the formal systems and the government has the curricular body wants to formally approve any materials coming through is that the traditional um, approval process is based on around the concept of a textbook or a kind of the unit of analysis of a textbook rather than a large repository of supplementary resources that um, you know so that the, the model for them billing for the approval process might be on a per unit basis and it just it becomes unaffordable for um, for bringing in um, a, a large body of, of open educational resources and there's no quick fix to that that's kind of a systems change thing and a mindset change but there is there is a lot of appetite for it, but a lot of also kind of roadblocks with traditional with the, mo the models of integrating with traditional publishers and kind of the financial kind of ecosystem and cycle there uh, can in some cases be a barrier as well. Um, as well as just the same things that we talked about here. It's, it's a huge amount of work to review and, and vet and understand if this is relevant, appropriate, aligned to the standards and objectives of, of the country. And so just so investing in that capacity rather than having to invest in high licensing fees is really the mindset shift that we need to keep pushing for. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, those kind of existing ecosystems have a kind of resilience of their own, if you like, and they can be difficult to overcome. I think 
one approach is, I think, to be ready for the arguments against. You know, so uh, with the OER hub, we set up a, an evidence hub of, like, based around 11 hypotheses and things like, you know, around quality, because um, commercial publishers will often try to sort of promote the idea that OER aren't, aren't as good quality as, you know, books that have been paid to be produced and those kind of things. So having the evidence that, that refutes those claims to hand, I think, is, is always useful. And also, I think, you know, just um, something we're perhaps not very good at uh, where I work, but I think certainly see a lot of it in, in the US is, you know, knowing how to play the advocacy game very well. So well, what's the problem that they have they want to solve? You know, and often you know, I don't want to be the guy who says, you know, like openness will solve all your problems, <laughs> you know, there are issues, but that certainly the, often if they have a particular issue, then openness can help, and OER can help solve the problem. So when we were during the pandemic, for instance, you know, lots of people were being furloughed or having to change jobs and that, and, and the UK government came to us and said, you know, are, are there resources around that can help people shift their careers? You know, and we sort of managed to find not only what was on Open Learn, but elsewhere, you know, open resources for people who wanted to kind of perhaps retrain in, in certain areas, those kind of things. So, so there was suddenly the openness was, was really useful to them and really important. And it can be around, you know, I think the point Jane makes is, is really pertinent. There's a kind of existing financial system that's quite difficult to overcome if you could do the complete flip, it kind of makes more sense. So instead of like paying publishers for an open access is a good example, instead of paying publishers to buy back your material, you could set up open access journals where you pay people to create the content. And that's a kind of a, a much neater shift and a, a better spend of money in many ways. And for instance, in, in where I live in Wales in the UK, they've developed a new curriculum, which is much more about adaptability and flexibility. And for them, uh, they can't really get a lot of the big publishers interested in that because they're, they're not quite a big enough market. So open textbooks make sense to them because A, they want to adapt it and B, it's a fairly sort of small market that would perhaps be better suited to paying people to produce the, the textbooks in the first place. So I think if there are particular problems you can find a way in at, then often the, the OER argument has more weight there. Yeah. Jack, can I Just, try to see? Uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, just yeah. to quickly, quickly build on the um, the financial piece. So one of the things that we're sensitive to and, and want to continue to support is, you know, there's the big publishers who will be fine, they'll adapt and so forth, but the small local publishers, making sure that we're not, you know, one of the legitimate potential criticisms is the disruptive influence of external OERs coming in and displacing local publishers. Like we could be pushing out uh, local knowledge creation of the time, the kind that we were talking about uh, today, and also displacing livelihoods if we're not helping to shift the ecosystem to investing in create funding the creation of that content locally that can then be released openly. So rather than paying for the licensing for textbooks, it's have government invest in local creators to create content that can then be openly licensed and then maintained over time. And it's, you know, it's much more sustainable if it's done in the right way, but we don't want to, we want to make sure that it's also not the uh, kind of perpetuating uh, kind of an imperialist external, like bringing in stuff and, and displacing um, existing uh, knowledge and, um, and livelihoods. So yeah, really thanks for highlighting that as well, Martin. Jackie, please, I can see that you have your hand up, so maybe you want to follow up on your question. Yeah, just to say, I mean, very insightful responses, and thank you for that. I think you both hit on um, what we've kind of recognized at UNHCR is key as well. And maybe just for the sake of others to give a, a little bit of a snapshot or a preview or a teaser, it's likely that there's going to be um, an initiative coming out of the Transforming Education Summit uh, that will be sort of chaired or led by UNESCO and UNICEF that will really try to focus and strengthen movements and support around OER use um, by governments. So I know UNESCO has been doing a lot of this work um, for a period of time, and now the conversation is really deepening to say a lot of the, the gaps when we look at digital learning are around content and access through um, 
platforms and access. So there's going to be, I think, more movement uh, in this space quite quickly. And so I really do encourage people who are on this call to, to be aware of it might be broadcast that session. And so if so, we can send out through Kula the link if, in case people are interested in participating. But it does sound like this will be an initiative that will be more of a wider partnership. So for those interested in engaging more on OERs, uh, keep an eye out and we'll share information as we get it. But definitely agree with both of your recommendations and I think it's a challenge that we continue to struggle with. So thank you. Thank you, Jackie. And yes, we would be happy to share uh, a link um, to join the conversation that is happening next week. Thank you. If we have no more comments, I don't know whether I'm missing any question in the chat box. Um, no, Nadia is saying thank you very much for the conversation. Um, I think uh, we can put the session to a close. Uh, I would like to thank Jamie. I would like to thank Martin. Uh, it was uh, really wonderful to have both of you today in our webinar. Thank you for sharing examples from your work um, and uh, helping us navigate really how we can use and leverage the, the potential of OERs and open education uh, in the work that we are doing uh, with refugees. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And um, we will soon be communicating the uh, information about our next webinar, which is going to be in October. Um, and please, if you would like to be invited to these sessions, get in touch with either myself or my colleague Yemi at the OpenTel, um, and then we can add you to the invitation list. Thank you very much. Have a very good uh, afternoon and day and evening. Uh, we are all in different time zones. Thanks, Kula. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for having us. It was a wonderful discussion. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone.